So coming up next, let me share with you what we've got. There is just so much that happened, so much report, so many reports that happened, good and bad, and I want you to kind of have you guys lean into this. So I'm going to bring up the first image here. We're going to talk about U.S. real uh, GDP, and it is right here. Uh, let's talk about this real GDP. So U.S. real domestic product uh, actually was above expectation. December, we just got this report. And one of the things that came out is we were predicting, so analysts were predicting a 2% gain in uh, 2024's fourth quarter. And it came in at 3.3%. And that report just came in now. Like It doesn't happen like the day of. And so all the data came in. We just got the report last week and it moved the market. In fact, we're going to talk about this. It led to what I'm calling the market melt up where money is starting to shift in the market. People who have money on the sidelines are going, Ugh, like maybe I'm too late. I should have moved money into the stock market. And uh, this is great news. Great news for the market. Great news for the economy. Uh, not the full picture but it was drastically over what we expected, which is great uh, for the U.S. Now, that may, just so you know, the Feds predicted pretty low GDP growth into 2024, and this might be an indicator that they're wrong about that also, and we might see some really strong GDP growth uh, into 2024, but I'm going to give you some contrasting beliefs as we look at that. Now, one of the things that is correlated with this, and you just got to see this chart. It's just fascinating to me. The S&P 500 and the Dow just hit an all-time high, guys, like record all-time high. And it was because of this data and some other data that I'm going to show you. But we're talking like uh, 4,940 price on the S&P. If you're trading it and you were in the markets this week, you saw this. A lot of you are going like, what's going on? Well, part of it has to do with GDP. Another part of it has to do with another section of data that I've pulled from. And then we'll get into some of the bumps uh, that I think might happen this year also. But CPI, let's talk about CPI. I won't show you this. But consumer price index rose by 0.3% uh, in December, higher than expected, pushing it to 3.4%. So it was predicted to come in at 3.1%. It got a 0.3% boost. It's like, and eh, that's not like, you know, quaking uh, major news, but not bad news and a little good, a little overexpected, uh, which also has been kind of pushing the market up. Now, job reports, I've got to show you this chart. Job reports are showing also better than expected data, which a lot of us were not expecting. Uh, this is playing into a lot of why you're not going to probably see rate hikes or excuse me, rate drops into 2024's first quarter. Good unemployment typically leads to not dropping rates. And so you can see here that we had January come in. We added 353,000 jobs. It's the most that we've seen since uh, January 2023. And so this is great news for the economy. It was overexpected. We were not expecting this kind of uh, job reports to come in, although I have some data specifically around legacy news and media uh, companies that are laying off like crazy. I want to talk to you about that also because I think there's a play in the market. Gas prices. How many of you guys have gotten fuel in the last week and it's like, oh, this, is, this feels like a breath of fresh air. It feels like gas prices are finally coming back down to normal. Well, they are. And I want to talk to you about what we're seeing in the charts and how this might uh, get better and how barrel prices reflect pretty directly what you're paying at the pump. So you got to check out this chart. This was something that I picked up off Yahoo Finance. Let's see here. And what it shows is the correlation between gas prices, crude oil and gas prices plummeting, where crude oil, I mean, we were at over, a, what is that, $120 per barrel, like mid-2022, and now we're seeing uh, barrel prices right around $70, which is bringing fuel at the pump at, 
you know, depending on where you're at in the country, around $3 per gallon. And so we're seeing a lot of relief, which has led also to consumer sentiment. Um, to give you an idea also, there was this really cool chart that I saw, and this, this is not so financially related, but I think you guys would benefit just from seeing this really quickly. There was this uh, chart that I saw that kind of breaks down what you're paying for when you go to the pump. And it kind of is frustrating. When I look at this, this chart, regular gasoline prices, 15%. And like, by the way, a lot of the blue states are way worse. Like California's tax uh, at the pump is like way higher than 15%. But on average, nationally, it's about 15% goes to taxes. 20% goes into di distribution and marketing. 8% of it goes into refining. And about 57% is the cost of the crude oil. So there's no question that last chart we saw is directly correlated to the price of what you have to pay for uh, at the pump. And I'm a little concerned about this sting where it's at. You know, we're seeing the relief, but one of the things that could radically change the price of oil is some of the conflict happening, happening right now in the Middle East that doesn't seem to be resolving. So some of the global pressures that we're seeing currently on crude oil, specifically tied to war, territory war, uh, some of the stuff still going on with like taking sides with Hamas and Israel, uh, it definitely could play into higher gas prices. Conflict is never good for oil. Uh, conflict, global conflict, global war is never good for economy. Uh, afterwards, we typically see spikes, but this all could impact crude oil prices. Also, we're seeing with the bump, the tick up in the economy kind of saying, hey, we're ready to launch. Demand for oil will likely go up, which may also bring prices up as well. So I keep an eye on that. Up next, Goldman Sachs pushes rate cuts to May. I won't show you the article on this, but I saw on Reuters, an article that said Goldman Sachs pushes back the Fed rate cut expectations from May or to May from March. And so that's a pretty significant quarter shift. And a lot of it has to do with employment rates going up. So employment, uh, overall employment has gone up and unemployment's gone down. We're starting to see uh, deflationary things like, you know, crude oil. People directly impact how the economy is doing with Oil prices actually being low, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but this is not like an actual data-driven statistic. This is a this is M Michigan's consumer sentiment, or excuse me, this is a Goldman Sachs analyst saying, based on all the data, this is our guess that the Feds will wait until May to drop rates. And frankly, with all the data that I've seen, I don't think we're going to see a March rate cut. The Feds are committed to cutting rates. They are calling a soft landing. In fact, uh, Bernanke kind of did this thing where, um, or excuse me, Federal Jerome Powell did this thing this last week where he said like, we kind of nailed it. We kind of hit our soft landing. And so we, I do expect rate drops this year, but with all the good data and kind of the likelihood that this might push a little bit of inflation, I think it is going to be May. I think Goldman Sachs analysts are correct. Uh, I want to show you this, just quick highlights from Michigan's Consumer Sentiment Index. And I'm doing all of this, guys, to give you a good sense from a fundamental standpoint where the markets are going to go. We'll do technicals after this, but you can kind of get a sense. I'm pretty bullish right now. I'm getting more and more bullish sentiment for 2024, uh, especially on the S&P 500 and the Dow. Now, this these three bullet points, I think, really highlight this report from Michigan, and I want to show you guys this. These are kind of the three uh, takeaways that I got from this, but Michigan's Consumer Sentiment Index is a way that we measure how the people are feeling about the economy. And we saw this jump about 13% from the previous month, blowing analyst estimates. Like analysts just didn't think this was going to happen. I was probably halfway in that group. I was kind of 50-50. And the second month sharply improved the sentiment, marking the index best turnaround, by the way, since 1991. This is the best shift in consumer sentiment, what consumers think 
about the market since 1991. And consumers feel much better about the economy with inflation expectations falling to their lowest level since December of 2020. So three great bullet points that things are turning around and consumers are in the belief that things are going to be getting better. Now, are things actually getting better? Well, let's talk about that. Tesla came out with a report that I think is really revealing and really great to look at. So now I'm going to give you the contrast. I'm, I'm hearing and feeling and getting a fundamental sense that we are heading into a more bullish market. However, here are some of the bumps that I would consider. Tesla just came out with a report that I think is uh, really important to look at. They came out with a demand report for investors, and this is something that you guys typically don't see. Let's see if I can find this. I'm going to find this really quick. There we go. And the reason I like bringing data like this in, here we go, is this is like the investor level information that most of the world doesn't see. And most of these articles are so boring, people don't like reading them. And we're going to talk about how the legacy media is going bankrupt and frankly losing in this game of like reporting news because frankly, these the data point information that is delivered that's like highly data driven, people aren't psychologically triggered to listen. And so there, there's this old, there's this weight that's going on in how we report, but we'll get to that in just a second. Tesla shares dropped 6% on weak auto revenue, warning of slower growth in 2024. And here were some of the reports that came out. Tesla reported revenue growth of 3% in fourth quarter, trailing estimates. And auto revenue increased just 1% from the earlier year. Vehicle volume growth in 2024 may be notably lower than last year's growth rate. And so what is happening, not just in the auto motive industry, but because of COVID, all the stimulus and, and frankly, uh, rates being higher, we're starting to see the impact of that happening now, where I would call it a buckling down, where companies are starting to see they have to tighten up, they've got to make cuts, and if they're not going to make cuts, uh, they're going to pay the financial repercussions later. So we're kind of seeing this cleaning up time, which is great, by the way. We need recessions for this. We need to have up and downs in the market to clean up kind of the the garbage out there in the market and really see who the fake actors are, right? They, there's this old saying that when the tide goes out, you see whose pants are down. Uh, kind of a funny anal analogy, but it's the truth. When the tide starts to go out, you start to see these companies that really weren't as financially responsible or didn't maybe have the right product to drive uh, or maybe the, they were over-evaluated. Maybe the consumer sentiment hype around it really wasn't following revenue and the future of its actual product. So we're going to see a lot of that with certain companies this year. Moving into the next segment of not so great news, and I have so many of these to show you, uh, I want to talk to you guys about this legacy. Oh, no, we've got to do this first. Do I want to do that? Yeah, we're going to talk about this. This is really important. So all of this all of this data really has me bullish but not for the right reasons and that's a really interesting thing to say like I want you to it, it, like kind of soak this in for a minute we're in new market territory like we've never seen the market like this ever and we're I'm calling a bullish market 2024 I think will end higher than uh it started uh, again not financial advice this is just you know a guy behind a mic talking, but I would predict personally, based on all my uh, data, that 18 months, 24 months from now, based on all this data and this chart I'm about to show you, that there's just no way the markets aren't going to go up. There's just no way. Although there will be companies that fail and like you know buckle down, we'll see things drop. But let me show you this one data point that largely has my belief going towards like. I just don't see how we're not going to have higher highs in 16, 18, 24 months. I just don't see the possibility of it. And it has to do with money on the sidelines. And a lot of you have probably never considered this. Like, how, Matt, how could the markets go up even higher? There's this saying in the market right now that the market is priced to perfection, 
Meaning like these stocks like NVIDIA, uh, <laughs> Google, Facebook are priced to perfection, meaning they're, proje- they're priced right now at a future projection of where it should be with no mistakes calculated in, like zero mistakes. And so how does that happen? In a normal market, that's what we call an overvaluation, right? Well, this is how it happens. We printed so much money, so much money during COVID. And when we started raising rates, it incentivized the money market accounts. And here's a chart that shows you what has happened, the difference in money market accounts from 2014 to 2023. It has almost doubled. And the largest increase of it happened from 2020 going forward. Why? Because we started increasing rates. And so what did people do? And maybe even you did it. They started putting their money in these money market accounts. In fact, I, I'm not soliciting this, but one of our local credit unions is doing a six-month uh, CD right now at 5.5%. And so people were taking their money out of maybe what they thought was more risky, locking it into this guaranteed 5.5%, you know, 5.5% return. And like, of course you would do that. Of course, like, especially your average consumer. And so if we go from $3 trillion dollars to six, over six trillion dollars. That's three trillion dollars sitting on the sideline that's not normally there. Now, why is it there? Rates are high. What will happen over the next 16, 18, 24 months as we stop dropping rates? That six month uh, money market account, CD, you know, whatever it's in, the uh, same markets, by the way. Uh, but what happens when you take that money out? What happens when your six month expires and the next best thing is three and a half percent? It's not five and a half percent anymore. You're going to go, well, three and a half percent, that's not really great. And the markets have been killing it. FOMO kicks in and people start dumping money into the market. So I think, and I'm predicting bullish because there's going to be this like FOMO that comes out into the market. And this is really fundamental. This is like the psychology of trading kicking in. Not maybe how I feel about things, but how people react to things. And the masses will see the climbs and like they always do, they get in too late. They get in, and by the way, I think that there's some room to go, but they'll get in and they'll keep pushing it even at the all time highs because they'll be like, oh, I missed out on all these gains and I'm only getting three, two percent now in this money market account. Imagine what will happen when three trillion dollars goes back into the stock market. That money's not going to just disappear. Consumers aren't going to be spending it on debt. We just saw GDP growth is up over expected. Let's just say we maintained it. Three trillion dollars dumps back into the market. You're going to see higher highs. And having said that, where are you going to see them? Well, safe bets always the S&P 500, right? Uh, putting it into a conglomerate of 500 stocks. But really, the magnific- the magnificent seven, as we call them, are the ones driving the S&P 500. Just look it up. The magnificent seven are really the only things performing right now in the S&P 500. And so that's seven out of 500 companies. I mean, there's a, a bunch of other little ones that are having massive growth, down growth, but really they're making up the bulk of the market, like the most money and market cap that's having the largest gains of those, the Magnificent Seven. Magnificent Seven. And if you take that out, that's 493 companies that really aren't doing that great. And so I think there's gonna be a lot of losers in this game. There are gonna be a lot of traders that are losing and going, what are you talking about, Matt? I'm losing my ass over here. It's like, well, okay, calm down. The market as a whole, the S&P 500 whole, largely held up by the Magnificent Seven likely will be the place where people dump into. And so I think we're going to see massive gains again in these big seven. And it's going to be mostly like riding the wave. It's going to be mostly like kind of this FOMO type trading that's occurring. Uh, And there's always opportunity there. You just need to be aware of the risk and be ready to pull out when things really start shifting and sentiment starts shifting pretty hard the other way. All right. So that's my, uh, I'm calling it a melting up of the market analysis. We're it doesn't sound great, right? It's like, wait, the market's going up, it's bullish. Isn't that supposed to be a good thing? Well, it's kind of melting that way, which may create some long-term problems two to three years from now, but I just don't see it happening anytime sooner than that. Now, there's so many other things I could talk about, like Asia's market. They're doing some stimulus right now to keep up their market. Uh, if they start going into 
a heavier downfall. It will have global impact. But generally, China's market doesn't impact our market that much. Now, let's go into this media thing. This media thing is so fun. I'm going to spend five, maybe seven minutes on this, and then we're going to jump in. I'm going to do a gold analysis, an S&P analysis on today's data. Uh, that's one of my fun things that I like to do on here. So let's jump into that. Um, where do I want to go here? There's so much to cover. All right, so I'm calling this our money mishaps section, the section where uh, we kind of wonder and make big mistakes when it comes to money. And frankly, the way I would say it is legacy news and media is dying. And here's just some bullet points before I bring up some articles to show you guys. The media industry uh, was beset by a series of layoffs impacting a number of sectors in 2023. Early this month, Challenger, Gray and Christmas, uh, an Alice Platement firm that tracks employment figures said over 20,000 media jobs have been eliminated just this year, and this is the largest number of cuts in employment since 2020 when COVID COVID was raging, and over 30,000 workers were laid off during that time. So we are having a massive layoff with uh, media companies right now, legacy news also included in that. And let me just share with you what's going on, uh, on there. So Business Insider, if you guys know who that is or you watch or sometimes see their stuff pop up, they're laying off around 8% of its workforce. Over 500 journalists were just laid off in January 2024 alone from the Los Angeles Times. The billionaire who owns the Los Angeles Times also said that he has lost over a billion dollars in the last year investing in trying to keep the LA Times up. Um, let's see who, Condone Nast is cutting 5%. Sports Illustrated is basically done, guys. The old Sports Illustrated where we used to get our news about the sports is pretty much toast. You could say that they are Probably going to be a brand that dies. Uh, Vox cuts another 4%. Jezebel sh is just shutting down. Uh, Vice Media went bankrupt. And here is where I want to talk about the why, and then we're going to go into our trading segment. So why is this happening? What is happening to these legacy and traditional media outlets, even some that are new that are digital? What is happening that's causing this massive fall fallout? Uh, amidst the union protests, which are like uh, n completely non-effective right now because there's just there's no money to give union workers more. They're just going to keep laying off more. There's no room for unions to come in right now and be asking for more. It's just it's ridiculous what's going on there. But anyways, that's happening. Um, but here's here's what you need to hear. Here's here's my thoughts on like what's going on here. So the news for so long as you watched. Because of the mass amount of information being produced was and, and the cost to produce an article. You know, let's say with a journalist cost, the cost of production, the cost of like, you know, editors, and then like keeping up and pushing out ads to maybe, you know, have things be front and center. Let's just say like, you know, it costs like a thousand dollars per post to come out. Well, to pay for just the journalist alone. You know, how many viewers do you have to have to, like, keep this up? How many, like, people need to watch and click? Well, if it's subscription-based, you're going to have a certain uh, way to break even that way. But if it's based on ads, which ads have been just funneling away from news and going in directly to the outlets, like directly to Amazon, directly to social media, Google, uh, Facebook, Instagram, being part of the Facebook family, and uh, TikTok, we're just seeing that people want to advertise directly where they can click onto the product, where the, these news sideline ads just really aren't the trick anymore. They're really not doing it anymore. So you have that decrease in ad revenue, but also even the subscription model is kind of really hard to compete with. And so news was kind of forced in between a rough and a hard place. Let me share what I think happened. They were forced to lie. And a lot of us saw that. Because the titles, in, instead of giving real data, like like podcasts like this, instead of delivering real content, which I get it, sometimes it's snooze, you know, sometimes it's like you, the eyes start glazing over a little bit because we're not triggered. We're not sharing maybe triggering information or a story or a provocative way of saying the information. Well, news started to have to do that. They would use any type of provocative angle 
to get clicks to make sure that they can monetize what they're ha having to do. And it got so bad that they frankly just started lying. They frankly just started making stuff up. And then the distrust and the media began. And this began probably in 2018, where we started hearing things like fake news. And it took the population a while to get used to this, to the point that we just got tired of it. We got tired of fake news and we started leaning towards things like this, like going to actual people who are in the industry, providing data specific around the thing that they were good at, rather than journalists who have no freaking idea what's going on in that industry, trying to give uh, an accurate account. Well, actually not an accurate account, a really great story that was highly clickable and thought provoking and maybe even triggering so that it kept your attention. Well, the attention war that they were using to win is now kind of backfired and people frankly are going to the experts rather than reading Sports Illustrated, they're going to someone who actually played sports and is giving the highlight from their angle. And we're seeing this new distribution of news and data uh, distribution where, and I'm so grateful for it, and I hope it goes more this way, where fake news just isn't valued anymore. And hyper, like hyped up negative news isn't sought after. In fact, when we feel it and we see it now, we might get triggered a little bit, but we've just seen it so much now that we kind of go, I'm just not even interested unless someone's providing a two-sided approach. And so I like to do that here at the Market Pulse podcast, where I'm giving you both the good and the ugly, and then my personal opinion. And sometimes I'll have a side, right? I might be pushing a side. It might be a little provocative. However, I'm someone who's trading. I'm not a journalist who's interviewing me, trying to understand what I do, and then throw a crazy angle on it so that you read through the article or watch the video. And I I hope, I'm very optimistic that this is the way that it's going. But because mm -hmm. of that, I think that the way media is being done on the internet, definitely paper media, like newspaper is just going away. But even a lot of the way we were doing this kind of provocative media online, I think will also disappear from this. So the death of media is what we'll call this. And so if you have any stocks in media companies like this, you might highly consider uh, the repercussions of that. Are there opportunities to make money? Absolutely. There's a lot of publicly traded media companies that frankly shorting, uh, and they're, they might be expensive to buy, but shorting may be a great opportunity if you can find some that are on the verge or have reports where revenue is not as great as they, uh, you thought they would be. Mm -hmm.